garages everywhere. Mechanics meet, sparkles are wrenched, rides are planned, stories are told, and dreams are hatched. This is our garage. Welcome to Farkle Garage, I'm Kim Rock. Over here, Clive Ironbud Brown, motorcycle riding instructor Dar Princess Scooter Pie Duncan, and Canadian Motorcycle Hall of Famer Steve Jane. And over my shoulder, Ken Mason and the Farkle Garage Band. On today's show, Clive shows us his iron butt, Dar rides with the ladies, and Steve shares his life with Harley Davidson. All this and more on this episode of Farkle Garage. more often than some people change their underwear. He puts on a lot of kilometers. How many in the last year? Well, six sets of tires and just over 100,000 kilometers. Unreal. There's a fine line between cruising and just farkling crazy. Grab some Preparation H, have a seat, and check this out. He crafts pizzas with the best of them. Langford's Clive Brown owns two pie shops. I've had pizza ability for about nine years. But he says he doesn't need the dough much anymore. <laughs> Okay, I do need the dough. It's an expensive habit. <laughs> you see, Clive's developed a case of iron butt. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. <laughs> He'd rather be riding. I would. <laughs> it's my second passion. However, iron butt, he says, is hardly an affliction. It's kind of like a gold star from the teacher. <laughs> a personal achievement held by 60,000 rugged iron butt association members worldwide. Becoming an associate of this loose-knit US-based endurance group is simple. You have to do what's known as the entry-level ride, which is called the SS-1000. Or the SS-1600K. The SS stands for saddle sore. It's rigorous documentation. Oh, and complete the ride in under 24 hours. The club lists a bunch of extreme rides, like the Bun Burner Gold, 2500K in 24 hours, the 10 tenths, 10,000 miles in 10 days, and the Trans-Canada Gold, coast to coast, in under 75 hours. Grueling rides. It's a lot of case, a lot of service, and it's a lot of tires. <laughs> Clive has eight certified rides this year with two pending. But he's a far cry from Iron Butt fame. One member rode nearly 227,000 kilometers in just one year. Clive? About 40 short of 70,000. Not bad, considering he tries to stick close to home to keep tabs on the business his son now runs and the three grandkids that keep his wife busy. I might just be at my happiest when I'm rolling down the road on my motorcycle. It's not about riding fast, it's about managing your time, reducing your stops. Routes and rest breaks are meticulously planned. The pit stop for fuel, my goal is six minute turnaround. Covered in electronics, his console, his lifeline on the road. The satellite communicator, GPS mounted on the dash, a radar detector, XM radio, switch for the auxiliary fuel pump, which refills my tank as I go down the road. And sleep, simple. A short motel stay or a few minutes under a shady tree. Everything is about safety. At any point in time, you're not feeling completely alert, completely comfortable, you stop. Yes, Clive truly is an iron butt. When I get off at the end of the day, I'm not in the slightest bit uncomfortable. But why? Clears the head. <laughs> Clive says just look at the dog drooling down the highway with his head stuck out the window. 
he gets it. Sometimes it takes a whole tank of fuel before I can think straight. Gives him time. Time we all lust after. I really do believe that when I come back after being on the road, I know I come back way more relaxed with some different outlooks on life. And I have friends and family that have told me that I am changing in a positive way. So I'm going to keep doing it. The beauty of Vancouver Island can't constrain him. The roads are fabulous, but there's not enough of them. He craves more room, more road, more time to contemplate, to consider the sights the pavement brings him. I don't see things when I stop. I see things when I'm moving down the road. So Clive, how many iron butts have you done this year? I've done six. Uh, a couple of them stand out. One was what's known as an SS3000, so 3,000 kilometers. I got off the ferry and rode to Alaska, then across BC, and then back down to Airdrie, Alberta. Wow. And uh, another ride, got off the ferry, rode to Phoenix. That's called the Bumbuna Gold. Did that in just under 23 hours. And then the Island 1600 is one of my favorite rides. I've done two of those so far. Two? Year. Two this year. So wow. far, yeah. Plan to do quite a few more. <laughs> Pretty amazing, Clive. <laughs> hey, you know, I've been uh, looking at your road glide here, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I see you got the stock gas tank on it, but you also got, it looks like another gas tank on the rear. That's a reserve tank. How much does that hold? That's eight, another 18 liters, and there's an electric transfer pump underneath, mm. which I have plumbed to go right into my main tank. There's an accessory switch on the dash. I just hit that switch refills the fuel tanks I'm going down the road. So How far do you go then without stopping, Clive? <laughs> 500 for fuel. Five, 550 kilometers. You have to document uh, your fuel stops for a certified IBA ride and you've got to do it uh, every 350 miles or less, which is about 550 kilometers. So when you stop, you have to have somebody that uh, signed you off? Like, no, like, uh, just a computer printout, gas receipt printout from, from the pump. So you have to verify that that's got the right address on it and the time. And sometimes it can be a little bit of a show and dance. Yeah. If, if it's got the wrong date on, they uh -oh, haven't programmed yeah. the pump correctly. And then you've got to get things signed off by everything. But yeah, it's all rigorously doc doc that's a lot of hours in the saddle like you must have something extra on there for to make it comfortable that's well, why he's got an iron butt that's right yeah <laughs> you got no nerves here man you got well no I, feeling it's, it's the opposite of what most people would think if you felt that seat as hard as a rock yeah and you just think back to the old tractor seats that were in the shape of a it's contoured yeah. to fit you they fit yeah. you exactly and that's what comfort is about fitment so how do you deal with the fatigue that this type of riding can produce well it's yeah, I don't get fatigued and the reason is because the motorcycle fits me and that's the key part because fatigue is dangerous it's, and the I Am Butt Association is all about riding safe. So if it's not safe you have to stop and everybody in the IBA will give you great kudos for stopping and bailing on a ride way more so than for completing it when you shouldn't have. Have you got an iron butt thinking of doing a long ride this year? Share it with us on Twitter, Facebook, at Barkle Garage. When we come back, we go from saddle sores to the social scene. Dar takes us on a ride with the Moto Mamas, a group of Vancouver Island girls sharing the passion of riding, coming up after the break. Ladies night. My Moto Mamas. The girls weekly rip. Round Victoria. Biker Paradise. Oh man, it's therapy. The Moto Mamas formed three years ago. A loose knit group of South Island gals, 150 strong and growing. Oh, it's a blast. Their rides as diverse as the women themselves. CTX 700, Maxi Scooter, Soft Tail Deluxe, Honda CBR. 600 RR super sport bike. <laughs> Cheryl's a wrencher and Harley enthusiast. Angela loves racing. Maceo, a university professor. I really like the independence, something I can do for me. I think it's the adventure, the feeling of freedom that you get, it's a way of completely clearing your head. Our passion drawing us closer together. Most of these people are people I would never have met in any other circumstance in my life. A growing group. The U.S. Motorcycle Industry Council says that one in four riders are female. The 
number of female riders increasing by 35% over the last 10 years. The course I'm teaching right now, we have seven women, three men. So, yeah, I'm seeing a lot more women coming into, the, into riding, and it's great. Surprisingly, many first-time women riders are in their 40s and 50s. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we were housewives. Now we're everything. Today, women are searching for the same thing men are, adventure. I'm nothing like my granny. I'm young, I've still got a lot of adventure left in me. We're buying more bikes too. The council says American women bought 12% of the bikes sold in 2014. Unfortunately, the industry it seems is just beginning to take notice. It is really tough finding bikes that uh, fit short people. Women's safety gear is slowly improving. It's fitting better and there's more selection. There should be. Women tend to be very safety conscious. It's constantly thinking like a mom in some respect. So you want to do it right. Across the country, more clubs like Motomamas are forming, creating communities of like-minded riders seeking the same thrill men do. I don't see any difference. Women riding simply to enjoy the freedom two-wheel spring. So guys, if you're a gals on Motomama, forget the flowers. Give them farkles instead. In Victoria, I'm Dar Duncan. It's great to get out with the ladies, but Dar, do we really need a women's riding group? Sure, but Motor Mamas isn't all about having women ride. We have the Moto Papas come out as well, as long as they're wearing skirts. Oh, nice. That'll be one ride I may have to miss. <laughs> Sorry, Dar. Well, I don't know, Steve. Nice. I, I heard you look pretty good at that little black number. Oh, no, they lost it at the dry cleaners last week, so, you know, we're out of the, that's out of the question. <laughs> yeah. No, but seriously, we, yeah. we let all the guys come out because we're all out riding and having fun, and why not share, share in the fun? Excellent. It's pretty awesome when you get a group of women going out together and the sisterhood of riding. Right, so it's not exclusionary no. towards those guys. No. We're not the bad guys then. Yeah, and we all like to ride to eat. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go have coffee, talk about motorcycling. It's amazing when you hear uh, women talk about motorcycling. A little bit different than men than that. And sometimes we're just as raucous as... They are. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But yeah, but it must actually be a pretty pleasant feeling, you know, the none of that testosterone getting in the oh, way. Oh no, we have of... some of our own. <laughs> and okay. our, I thought the, it was estrogen. You guys well, have. it's a little bit of that too. Yeah. But it's everything from 50 cc scooters up to sport bikes, dual sports, cruisers, everything. Maxi scooters. We ride it all. Ride it like you stole it. <laughs> Perfect. How many yeah. people do you get out for? Uh... Uh, the average ride is about 10. Yeah. There's about 153 of us on Facebook in the group, though. And that, so it's mm -hmm. just, we try to get out for regular rides. It's been a little bit tough lately because, you know, everybody's busy and living their life. So right. it's a good thing. And what's the benefit for women riding together? Um, I think it's a mentorship and sisterhood and that because you, it's all about nurturing the um, novice rider, the new rider, and, and bringing them along and just giving them that, um, that empowerment and letting them know that they can do this. It's awesome. <laughs> Vancouver Island Safety Council riding instructor Bill Laughlin drops by to talk about ADGAT and conspicuity. Can you see me now? We'll be right back.
us in the garage, Vancouver Island Safety Council Riding Instructor Bill Laughlin. Bill, welcome to Farkle Garage. Thank you for having me. At GAT? All the gear, all the time. What's your thoughts, Bill, on uh, the squid that you see blasting by with his thongs on and his shorts? I shake my head. Um, one is they don't realize how fast they become dehydrated, and I just worry about when they go down, what's going to look like. Yeah, exactly. And, and the new safety gear is, is comfortable to wear as well. Yeah, there's great gear out there, even for the summer, mesh jackets. There are uh, lots of airflow through them, and you can get nice bright clothing as well that makes you visible. It's good stuff to have. And the armor, the new Kevlar jeans, and so it's not just all about leather or textile. You can add a good Kevlar jean to that and feel protected. And Right. Good stuff. Not, not overheat. Not overheat, and you know, if you're out in the sun for quite a while, uh, wearing short sleeves and or shirts, uh, on shorts, you're gonna lose a lot of your, uh, you're gonna become dehydrated much faster than if you do wear proper clothing. You hear a lot of motorcyclists say they'd rather sweat than bleed because that's what's gonna happen when you roll across the pavement, so. Yeah. And I know when it gets really hot, uh, you switch back to non-mesh non gear. You know, once you exactly. get above 35 degrees, I know riding down in the desert down south, that's what the guys, well, they all do that. They switch back to like layers. Yes. They layer themselves up for the dehydration and it also keeps you cooler. It does. And you can even wet some of the undergarments to help keep you cool as well over time. And don't forget the feet. You need uh, riding boots for your feet. I have mesh riding boots yeah. on as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> or mesh panels, anyhow. <laughs> and conspicuity? Conspicuity, that's the, what we call it the art of being seen. We want you to be seen out there, whether it's lights on your bike, uh, proper uh, neon type helmets or jackets or, or clothing. The, the brighter you are, the easier you are for other people to see you. Thanks, Bill. On our next episode, Dar takes us through the cones when she visits a Vancouver Island Safety Council novice rider course. His first bike was built out of wood. Now, after 40 years in the motorcycle industry, Steve Drain is retiring. He plans on spending more time riding two wheels than selling them. Up next, we take a look at the man whose life was and is motorcycles. No mistaking that sound. They say it sounds like potato, potato, potato. Something that you can really get attached to. Loved and hated by millions. Some cringe, some crane, searching for that Harley, belching freedom's end. Steve Drain's been making roads and tracks rumble on Vancouver Island for nearly 40 years. That one run after riding that hill climb for 15 years, I knew the minute I took off from the start that this was going to be the premier run, and it sure as heck it was, you know. Nailed to the wall, the life of a biker. First bike, my dad and I built, and it had a wooden frame. The second was driven by a gas-powered washing machine. Everybody made fun of it, but then all the other kids wanted to ride it. Much like Steve's, the first Harley was built in a backyard shed in 1903 by childhood friends William S. Harley and Arthur Davidson. Like Steve's story, the Harley-Davidson tale is one of survival. Two great wars, the Depression, all that sort of stuff, it really shows. Between 1900 and 2010, they competed against hundreds of rival manufacturers. They outlasted them all. One company, Harley-Davidson, out of almost 400. The Pistons' thunder seized him early in life. He worked as a mechanic after school when he was 13. At age 18, I was working in the shop as journeyman mechanic. Since then, he's peddled chrome and metal to thousands of men and women. Basically, it started from zero. He opened his first store in 76, a tiny shop on Douglas Street. Went up and you turned one handlebar in first and then the second one. It just had a standard sized door. His Harley Davidson dealership began in 87. Some of his best years, he says, spent on Cloverdale Avenue. Very, very good place. Before moving to Langford. And I enjoyed 16 years there, but Always in the back of my mind, I knew at some point we were going to build a standalone, purpose only built Harley Davidson store. In 09, he went from 5,600 square feet to 30,000, just as the global recession began slamming retail doors shut. The downturn hit us and it hit us hard. Sales slipped by 40%. But Steve says he's been here before during the 80s recession. It was a tough haul, and you know, everybody thought I was going to turn turtle. To survive, 
he sold over 700 lawnmowers. I don't know. My dad brought me up just to keep grinding away at it, you know. And so the very freedom he sells keeps this dog chained to the desk. He never married. No, I'm married to the motorcycle shop. Sometimes I look at it and I say, you know, I wish I could have, would have, but uh, I'm not mad about it. If this is his wife, then racing's his mistress. I've uh, had a go at just about everything that you could race on two wheels. Dragsters, road race, motocross, sidecars. But his forte, he says, was the hill climb. We devastated everybody, 1979, 80, 81, 82, and 83. He holds the Mount Doug hill climb record, a race with a 65-year history. If he had a son, it'd be this guy, Damien Cowden, his shop mechanic turned drag race. It's not for everybody, but Damien is the man for the job. Steve's taking him under his wing. He's working on a new power plant for a new bike, then uh, we should be raising a few eyebrows in the next year or so. Yes, Steve says he's happy with his two-wheeled relationship. It's been a good ride. Yeah, yeah, it's good. The big thing for me is the people I meet. We end up with more of a relationship than just being simply customer and bike shop owner. I've had the real privilege of meeting so many neat people and a lot of them are very, very good personal friends of mine. And that's one thing that keeps me really going. Steve says he rides when he can, never as much as he'd like, he travels, and he still tinkers with the relics. 30 years ago, I watched this bike <laughs> over the fence at Westwood Racetrack, and it was him raising it. <laughs> so here we are 30 years later. Now it's going to be a vintage battle of the twins. Yeah. Steve says he'll keep on chugging along for as long as he can. He jokes it's about his retirement plan. You're just going to find me at my desk one day, keeled over. I mean, that's just going to be the way it is. Steve's a dog with a bone. A lone wolf who's witnessed four Harley dealerships fold on the island. Harley Davidson actually has a soul. You get attached to that sound, you get attached to the way you sit on it. It's like flying an aircraft that you're three feet off the ground. Every day is a challenge. The dollar, the economy. We just keep on grinding. And if that doesn't sound like the biker spirit, I don't know what does. In Langford, I'm Paul Weinstein. You've spent most of your life racing, repairing, and selling motorcycles. Now what? I don't know. After today, I think Clive's going to take me shopping, and I'm going to join your club. You're going to be a motor <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't on. know. Sounds like a lot of fun, but you know, seriously, uh, if I worked so long for uh, for such a long time, I put aside a lot of stuff, and I think I'm going to go back to road racing motorcycles. It's something I did 30, 35 years ago, and I really enjoyed it, and I really missed it. So I'm resurrecting all my old race bikes, and I got them up there in my race shop now, getting them ready. So next spring, hopefully going to get out and uh, compete in vintage racing. I'll be running an XR1000 Harley, a Honda CB504, and a Suzuki XR05 um, factory road racer. So. Nice. That's quite a range of bikes. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're stuff, they're, they're all from the uh, like early 70s on up, and mm -hmm. vintage road racing is about my speed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Still fast enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> those are no slouches, those motorcycles. Oh, yeah. It's, it's great getting out there on the track with everybody going in the same direction and no driveways and no cars and all that sort of stuff. It's uh, probably, you know, when I look back at all the racing, the different types of racing I've done over the years, it's the most exciting. And uh, it, it really feels great to get out there. So I'm looking forward to getting back into it. Is there one of those bikes that's your particular favorite, Steve? My XR1000, yeah, my Harley V-Twin, it sounds so good. <laughs> when you hear that thing at full tilt going down the straight stretch, everybody stands up and, and cheers, you know, so it's- uh, Very low production bike that, was it not? Yes, it was, yeah. We sold very few of them back. Like I built that one out of a street bike wow. and uh, we didn't have too many to sell. We only sold three of them back in 83, 84. And uh, they were low production, not too many of them around, but they sound great. Hope you enjoyed hanging out at Farkle Garage. Like to see more? Check us out on Facebook, YouTube, follow us on Twitter, got an event? Send us an email. 
Remember, a life behind bars is better than a day at work. Keep the rubber on the road and those sparkles off the pavement. See you next time, bitches. Spot the fire, <laughs> boots are on the ground.